bear in mind that what we're talking about in this tape is Reading, Pennsylvania in the late 50s, early 60s, when it was a heavy industrial city. It, it isn't that anymore. So with that said, it, because it's important, there were a lot more people and a lot more money there and so forth. In 1959, the Justice Department looked at Reading and declared that the Philadelphia Bruno family, Ma family, had, and this is a quote, an outright rape of an American city by the mafia. Working with local bad guys, someone named Abe Minker, he called himself the general, the Brunos operated in the city from the 50s and 60s, and they together corrupted virtually every city administrator from the mayor on down, police chief. They owned them outright. They set up, uh, the mob now, set up uh, an illegal sort of uh, Las Vegas uh, in the city in what the Justice Department described as the biggest crap game east of the Mississippi. Bobby Kennedy said it was more than that. It was the biggest crap game in the entire country. The Reading Game, it was called. It operated out of Philadelphia from the 50s to 1962 when the FBI finally moved in and closed it down. The game was run nine times a week. And each game involved a pot of between 50 to $100,000. Each night, big, big time gamblers from all over the East gathered at a restaurant in downtown Philadelphia. They'd be driven 50 miles to Reading where the million dollar dice game was going on on California tables. Anyway, a Bruto member said, quote, everybody made a buck on the game. They rented their limousines from a funeral director because they only used them from 10 at night until seven in the morning. They even had a cop out in front of the restaurant where they gathered. He'd blow a whistle like a hotel doorman to signal a limo when he had a full load coming in for the game. It looked like an opening of a Broadway show. The cops never touched them. Reading was also home for a while to the biggest illegal still in operation since prohibition had ended. Um, it was remarkably tied right into the city water supply, so there was no charge for the water. The city let that happen. Well, the corrupted leaders of the city let that happen. This still had to show you how big it was. It made a, it had a capacity to produce 4,800 gallons of untaxed liquor a day. Uh, the tax fraud involved was $3.9 million a year. Now, that was in 1960 dollars, so who knows what it would be today. The still owners managed to have the city council conduct a quick installation uh, of the sewer to get rid of mash. It's the, the byproduct when you make liquor. A Reading uh, city councilman he actually made arrangements for laying the sewer line and supervised it himself. The owners turned out to be Philadelphia racketeers Augustine and Joey Mazio. Benito Tedesco, who liked to call himself Benny Rubin, and Anthony, oh boy, Konosaki of Newark. It turned out that the distilled product was stored at warehouses owned by the Di Cavente family. There's a tape recording of Simon Di Cavente telling the boss, telling Dominic Corky Bastello to repay a debt that was owed within the family. He said, Corky, I want you to take 75 cans of liquor that equals three grand and put them away because Frankie Cococcio owed Dapper Frank Dapolio three grand. Also involved in that distillery was the Philadelphia, New Jersey operative named Ignatius Esposito, who was eventually sent away for five years for his role in that, in that thing. Anthony Caponegro, who was a conciliary under Angelo Bruno in the Philadelphia family, had been called into Reading to teach people up there how to run a still, how to manage a still. Uh, he was arrested. And anyway, uh, while he was in the waiting room during the trial, an alcohol tobacco agent came in, took a photograph of him, and the capo negro punched him in the face. He was eventually convicted for that attack on a federal officer. Abe Minko, the general, was, let's just call him a general for now, was one of the largest independent syndicate leaders in Pennsylvania, if not in the United States. He ran a whole conglomerate of illegal activities up in Reading, booze, gambling, girls, everything. He let it be known to anyone who was interested that he paid 30% of his profits to the Genovese family in New York. However, no, his, he let it be known so no one would bother him. Meeker's partners and other ventures included Dominic Olivetto, who was the only boss of the Angelo Bruno family later, and Joe Perfacci, the boss. Second in that organization was the general's nephew, Alex Feudman, until he was eventually placed with this guy named Benny Bono, who was more acceptable to the mobs. 
Benny Bonanno, I'm sorry. In 1957, the Attorney General of Pennsylvania published uh, the reports of an investigation that showed that 50,000 extortion money was paid to fund men by independent jukebox operators uh, through this phony company that the general set up with them called Brooks County Amusement Association. Fudman demanded the payments and made it really simple on tape that you pay or you don't put your jukeboxes here. That's all. He was eventually, he, John Whitting, and Alex uh, Fudman, Louis Fudman, his brother, were indicted and charged with blackmail. John Wittig, the guy who was charged with him, he was a convicted murderer. He was basically the general's top guy, top enforcer. He was a thug. He was a as the, the case against them approached trial, the prosecution witnesses just didn't show up. They realized what they had done and they changed their mind. So the state had to negotiate a plea with them, Fudman and Wittick. They received suspended sentences. So <laughs> Wittick and this guy, Paul Jaslow, they were principal operators in the, in the general's enormous numbers bank meaning he had millions of dollars to back up his bank and he could take money, he could take bets in from anywhere, and it was solid. Jaslo was a failed businessman uh, who joined up with a local crime boss named Tony Moran for a few years and then quit the rackets and then came back and joined up with the general. Wittick had been a very close friend of Tony Moran's for years. In fact, he was considered his right-hand man until June 4, 1939, Moran, Joslow, and Whitting are arrested for suspicion of running a gambling operation. Uh, Moran, Whitting, Jaslow entered guilty pleas. The judge sentenced Moran to nine months and, and a thousand dollar fine. Um, Johnny Whitick, the Moran lieutenant, got an identical sentence. Jaslow got probation, let go with five hundred dollar fine. In March of 1940, Moran says, "I've got, I can't be in prison. I've got stomach issues and a heart thing." And a, they bought it remarkably. He, he, was, he said oh, it also was a hardship for him to be in prison. He was a millionaire by that point. So he was released on September 25, 1940. He promised he would stick to legitimate business and just work in his florist shop, which you know he didn't do. In the meantime, the general's building up this organization. Uh, Moran now has odds with the general. He thinks it's not just his town anymore. And then him and Wittick had a falling out. What happened was Moran learned the, that the general was trying to recruit Wittick in the spring of 1939 when Moran was in jail for trying to run a lottery, his own lottery. So when the Moran is released in 1940, Wittick said he was broke, he couldn't pay the $1,000 fine, the judge had sentenced him. So. And man, Moran, who had the money, just refused to pay, uh, which blocked an early release for Wittick from jail. After that, it, it was just, it fell out between them. They never got together again. And Wittick ended that when he shot and killed Moran, uh, March 22, 1945. That night, Wittick had been drinking heavily at the embassy bar on Penn Avenue, Penn Street rather, I'm sorry. It was a March 21st, a freezing night. And then he went to the Crystal restaurant. He got something to eat and stumbled a few doors down to Moran's gambling joint. Wittick had been a dealer there and then was a master dealer just a few weeks before. Moran was sitting on this high chair that he sat in way back so he could overlook the tables way in the back of the casino. Wittick, drunk, walked up and killed him. He shot him four times, three in the body, once in the arm. Uh, Moran's last words were, I'm dying. Don't accuse nobody. I've done it myself. Okay. So Wittick turned himself in the next morning. He said, I was there. I don't remember being there. If you say I was, I was. And I sure as hell didn't shoot Moran. He said it was, quote, an unidentified Italian looking stranger in town that killed him. The weapon, the murder weapon was never found, but the 38 bullets, they asked Wittig, well, do you own a 38? He said he did, but he had no idea where it was. Wittig was convicted of second degree murder and he received a 10 to 20 year sentence. But he was paroled on December 20, 1951. He served six and a half years. Later, the governor, John Fine, commuted the sentence completely. Moving along to Frank Donat. Uh, he was a partner in Numbers Bank in Reading. Prior to his murder on November 26, 1963, IRS agents raided his house. They found huge quantities of cash. That made the newspaper, and it spread throughout the underworld that Donato had cash. Let's get him. He was kidnapped. 
he was kidnapped, but he escaped and he called the cops. Uh, a few, just a little while later, somebody murdered him. And it was probably his kidnappers to keep him from testifying. When local citizens in Reading became a problem, the, brought, the mob brought in its own, <laughs> they went and found and ran their own reform candidates. Finally, in 1969, 61 rather, a Justice Department task force moved in. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover sent in a brigade of FBI agents who arrested 100 gamblers in one night. Uh, federal investigators found that the only civic improvement in the city for years prior was the installation of new parking meters, which was odd. So they looked into it. The company who owned the parking meters had a long record of just bribing people to get their their uh, machines in there. So they didn't, instead of accepting lower bids, as an example, the mayor, John C. Kubaki, who could give lessons on corruption, he extorted or conspired to extort 10 grand and a grandfather's clock for some reason from two companies that sold meters in the city. The mayor and two record kingpins were, were tried and found guilty. Uh, as a first time offender, Kobaki, as corrupt as he was, served one month in jail and was fined $5,000. But he went before a more sympathetic federal judge who was a friend of everybody, and he rescinded the whole thing. So, you know, basically nothing happened. The general's lawyer, the general was also involved with this, uh, managed to have the sentence he was given in the case tied on to his tax evasion case, even though one was a local charge and one was a federal charge. Just remarkable. In 1961, what happened was the general was convicted of evading 130 grand in what the federal government calls waging excise taxes. So you can gamble, but you have to pay for the money you made on it. Uh, he had made a period of 1.2 million and didn't pay any taxes on that. Attorney Bobby, Gen Bobby Kennedy, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy just said, well, this is crazy. And when he went out and told, get this guy, get this guy, General, put him away. And he called his arrest just a huge accomplishment and pushed the IRS to file a civil suit to collect $2 million in back taxes owed by the general. In 1962, as I said before, the FBI just crushed the Redding game. The Bruno family, they're under a lot of pressure. They just thought, let's get out of here. And they more or less retreated back to Philadelphia. Uh, 1965, the general was convicted again in federal court with this guy, Joe Fiorini, who operated one of Maker's sub-banks. In other words, you could put up money and contract a, a gambling bank from him. They were both charged with conspiring to avoid uh, waging taxes. In 1962, after the FBI gambling raids had caused so much doubt about the city's police chief, that he was just a crook, in order to make himself, because he was now the chief, Charles Wade was he was under pressure and was going to be indicted. So to make himself look honest, what he had done is he convict, he conducted his own raid on Farini's headquarters, uh, but he didn't get permission from the general. And he sees records that shows that Farini and Meeker, the general, were underreporting their waging income. There was a quick meeting held and Wade said, look, I screwed up. And he told the general, I will absolutely destroy the records. And said, between the time that happened and, and he was indicted himself on federal charges. So uh, he turned the records over to the government in, to get a lower sentence. Uh, he also said that he had bought his job, police chief, from the general for 10 grand. <laughs> and that while he was a police chief, he was on the general's payroll as well as for protecting his games. In 1965, Minker and Mayor John Kubicki were convicted of extorting 10 grand in kickbacks on the parking meter thing and were sent off to jail. 